if I was going to look at what is an optimal program, if I can get them to show up more days than not. And three things, we'll stick with the rules of three here. So we got, if that drives them to be uh, more consistent than not, if it drives them to uh, be more willing to utilize other facets of the program, be it maybe they have a small side talk with an ATC about some prehab specific stuff that's not my opinion, perfect, utilize the program to your full capability. And three, uh, keep them out of the PT or the medical side as much as you can. And I think if you're doing these, then it's probably optimal for you. All right, welcome back to Mops and Mo's with Drew and Alex. Feels weird being the one to say that one. It's usually we've Drew's switched line. It. We've switched it yeah, up we, this we week. We switched it up on this one. And Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas Eve, I should add. I'm assuming, yeah, this will come out on Christmas Eve, right? Yeah, this is, we're in the holidays for sure. Sorry, happy holidays, not Merry Christmas. Yeah, we're we're non-denominational. We welcome all <laughs> listeners here. So, Drew, who do we have on today as a guest? So, we do have a guest on today. His name is John Mackersey, and I'll, I'll read off his bio here in a second. But this is less an interview of John. That's probably something that we'll do in the future, and more a a conversation, a game show, if you will, wherein uh, myself, Alex, and John each came to the table with three things that we have changed our mind on with regards to tactical human performance, sort of broadly speaking. The game was to basically go top to bottom, three things, uh, and trigger discussion on each one of those. So anyway, having said all of that, so John John Mackersy, I've known John now for a number of years, uh, remotely for most of those. He's currently over in Germany. He is a strength and conditioning coach with over 15 years of professional coaching experience in collegiate athletics and more relevant to today within special operations. He began coaching in Division One athletics, and he's been working with special operations forces since around 2013, so one of the early kind of POTIF SOCOM guys. Uh, as, is, as is the nature of the beast, he has, in addition to coaching, spoken and lectured at numerous occasions for the NSCA at national and regional levels. I know right now he's putting some good stuff together for the tactical strength and conditioning world over in the, in the, I almost said the UK, over in Germany. Uh, and he also prepares individuals for certifications and exam prep. Uh, in his own words, he's a strong believer in the power of all things old school. Uh, he and I have connected on numerous occasions around the art, maybe the art and science, but it, certainly the art of stone lifting. We both have an affinity for lifting heavy rocks in Scotland. Uh, but he is also known for his influence of newer technologies and training methods which, as always, make for innovative, prescriptive, and purposeful training. Uh, you'll hear him mention this in the episode uh, a little further on towards the end. He has his undergrad in psychology from Maryville College and a master's in psychology from Miami University of Ohio. So one of those coaches that comes to the exercise science space from a slightly different direction, which is always fun to listen to. Yeah, this was a good one, some good dialogue. Um, all credit to Drew for coming up with the the game show style of this one. That was definitely not me, but I think it produced some pretty cool conversation. Um, echoes of a few conversations we've had before. I think several of the topics that came up are definitely themes on the podcast overall, but definitely some some solid discussion of largely, you mentioned art and science before, largely on the art side of the art and science of human performance. Yes, and... Alex doesn't know he has this homework assignment yet, but around the time when this podcast publishes, he's going to create an Instagram post that will be a sort of call to action for the community. So we listed three things each in this episode that we've changed our mind on. And I want to encourage the folks out there that like to engage in social media conversation. I'd like to see what you guys have changed your mind on in terms of you know your perspective as a coach. Maybe if you're an athlete, some things you might've changed your mind on, but It'd be cool to see some conversation get started over the holiday break around where people may have thought that they were going with uh, with human performance and, and maybe where they've arrived at now uh, with, with their line of thinking. So you were here when it happened for the first time ever, listeners, when Drew finally fed me some content for social media. I've listened, I've posted a lot of stuff about baking and bread, and you could have at any point stolen any of that and reposted <laughs> it on Mops and Mo's. Uh, I think, you know, they say abs are made in the kitchen somewhere along the line. So really anything baked, I think, or sourdough related is probably uh, relevant. So not the first time, uh, but I appreciate that. Thank you. 
Enjoy. Hey guys, before we kick this episode off, just wanted to give a quick plug to the two options that we have for folks interested in training with us. We have the team-based long and strong program. And then if you are interested in a more engaging, intensive, uh, more tailored option, we offer one-on-one coaching as well. And you can find both of those on the training tab of our website, mopsandmoes.com. And if it's the team training you're interested, click that link and you will find a one-week free trial. So again, if any of the things that we talk about on this podcast are interesting to you as far as training goes, head to the website like Alex just mentioned, select that training tab and follow the instructions from there. Enjoy the episode. First of all, I want to hear about, I mean, Alex, you mentioned that John talked to you about working with leadership. Well, yeah, no, we had a, we had a good like little brief DM exchange or whatever about like how to get commanders on board with like goal setting and things like that. But do we, are we skipping straight over the tart or do we want, do we want to hash that business out? Listen, I bought a bunch of apples and they did not taste great as apples. So I also have this little like spirally peeler core slicer thing, mm-hmm. which I mean, by the way, if you want to spin... the one that clamps onto the countertop. Yeah. For like, I think things tw- are money. 20 yeah. bucks, dude, the most fun gadget I have in the kitchen. So, uh, we'll tr- drop a link in the show notes. <laughs> Sponsored by the Apple. Yeah, spiralizer. sponsored by the Apple Spiralizer <laughs> from China. So it was raining all day yesterday, and I was like, "Screw it, I'm going to make an apple tart." So I did, and I used the flour from, uh, shout out Carolina Ground Flour, also in the show notes. Some like <laughs> overpriced artisan, whatever, and uh, it turned out lovely. So thank you for the shout out. Uh, Listeners to the show will will be a little bit confused. There's been a few weeks here where we've gone down baking rabbit holes, and that's. I don't if think it's that we've Drew, gone down. I think it's that this has always been me and you're, we're just like slowly uncovering it because I'm not true. as it has prolific on the Instagram as you are. Those, those <laughs> who are on Instagram and know us from there, they'll have figured out by now that the Mops and Moe's Instagram is just me. And if you follow Drew on Instagram, I'm it's private 100%. Now. It's golf, girl, mm-hmm. dad, and baking. That's like all it is. I got real tired of posting videos of me working out, so I stopped. And then guys like John are squatting my deadlift. So I was like, what's the point? <laughs> Why am I doing this? <laughs> Oh man. But uh yeah, so that's that's me in a nutshell. Perfect. John, do you have any like, culinary updates you want to dive into before we talk about strength and conditioning? I smoked a brisket on Saturday and that's about as exciting as it gets for me. You still have the uh green egg? Did you have a green egg for a while? Oh my gosh, dude. So we were moving uh this was like two years ago, two and a half years ago. And I'd never moved one of those before, but they're insanely heavy. Yeah, it's like ceramic, isn't it? Yeah, so we picked this entire thing up with its base and the grill as one unit and put it in the back of my buddy's truck. And we're going down uh, like this little highway to turn onto an entrance ramp to get on a bigger highway. And he turns left and this grill just tips oh, no. right and shatters all over the, the <laughs> all over the entrance ramp to this highway. <laughs> no. So I haven't had a green egg for like two and a half years. <laughs> Sorry, too too soon. Still touchy stuff. So. No, it's fine because every Memorial Day weekend I send him a text of the picture of it shattered on the side of the highway. And I was like, this, this happened exactly two years ago nice. or one year ago or whatever it's meant. So we're at next year, three years. How much does a green egg cost? They're not cheap. They're not cheap. You should have collected all the pieces and sent them a piece every year. Well, yeah, it, it was it was really funny because we were we were pretty mortified and we're driving down the side of the road. And he was the lead truck in this three car entourage. We had to move to my new house. And so grill goes shatters everywhere. And we kind of stopped up and it was expensive enough for me to stop and just kind of give it like one of these and and feel really bad about what was going on, but we couldn't stop traffic. So we just kept going and we unloaded everything as fast as we could. And we get back to where it tipped over and Germany be in Germany somebody had swept all of the remnant <laughs> pieces onto the side of the road and it was just lined up. So I had to go and like sweep, sweep that with a dustpan and like into the back of my car. So I didn't like litter. Man. That is extremely Germany. I remember like a while back people were joking about like sweeping the forest and like cleaning up the forest and stuff. But if you spend time in Germany and you're like anywhere near a populated area, they really do clean up the forest. Like there's stacks of, 
firewood that yeah. you can just take they're neatly stacked everything's like manicured it's ridiculous the whole forest it's it's super impressive how they do it do they sell green eggs in germany yes i don't know why yeah, i just would have thought that you get another one yeah no i don't i don't blame you i just didn't even know if you could even find them over there yeah so like you can find most of the stuff but it's say say green eggs like 800 bucks or whatever it is and however much it would cost the company to ship it over here plus any kind of vat or taxes or import whatever you're going to pay that too so if it's 800 us it might be like 1200 euro Ugh. over here Ugh. yeah so that won't be happening but i have a traeger hell yeah so that so we keep we keep rocking with that nice and or it's been good. It hasn't fallen out of many cars and we're good. <laughs> All right, Alex, leadership, go. Yeah. I mean, I don't have much to say here other than to hand it back over to John, but I know we had a, a brief exchange about this. I think it came from, I put something up on the Instagram story about like how many commanders know what the goal of their physical training program is. And, and my reason for bringing that up is you can't really evaluate the effectiveness of a program unless you know what the goal of the program is in the first place. And I think there are, a ton of organizations that are just like out there doing exercise and calling it good. And I think we could, I mean, theoretically by policy commanders are supposed to set a goal and it's supposed to be based on the mission and all that stuff. But I don't know if that really happens. And you made a good point about how you kind of trick them into getting there kind of, I don't know if you want to put it that way, but I just kind of love to hear you rehash what you said about how you engage with commanders on that. Yeah. So it can, it can be a super mixed bag all the way down from, company to battalion level or even team level if you consider that all the way down and you know i think we're in a super weird time of i mean apart from some recent happenings you know we're, we're kind of getting to like a garrison life shift over the past year which has led to some kind of different trains of thought and training modalities and goals and whatever have you um so i think my comment was just like you know most i think most leadership kind of struggles to clearly define what training is and how to get there and my whole thing is you just kind of be you just got to be the squeaky wheel and you just got to say uh you know hey i think this would really fit this model pretty well or we have these three weeks coming up in block leave let's just make this an arbitrary training time and let's see what we can get done in three weeks and you just kind of throw short little goals at them that lead to bigger goals and then, you know, if you can kind of get them to take a couple of bites at the beginning, usually they'll keep coming back. I think that's only going to get a little more murky just as time goes on, because hopefully we don't have a lot going on. And hopefully the guys have some time to expand some training goals. But, you know, so we're, we can have a little bit more say so in how that goes. But that that's pretty much what I was trying to get at. I, th I think one really good example is I was talking to even all the way down to the team level, I was talking to the this team started, this was last summer. And he was like, Hey, I want my team to train hard. And I was like, okay, <laughs> cool. Like, what is, what does that mean for you? And he was, he just flat out. So he's like, I have no idea. So I was like, well, what did it like? If, if you left your team start role and somebody else stepped in and took your space, what would you want to brag about your team being capable of? Like if that guy came in and was like, Hey, what can this team do? And you were like, they can do, xyz and you were super stoked about it and so i was like you don't have to give me an answer now but you know maybe by the end of the week stop by and just just give me something and we can run with that and so a few days passed and he comes back at the end of the week and it was i really want my guys if they had to drop everything they were doing right now and really efficiently ruck 10 miles they could it's like okay we will we'll go with that for now. And obviously that includes a lot more than just rucking. You know, we, we include a lot of other stuff, but you know, it's like, Hey, we have, we have nine weeks to the end of the summer. Let's test them on Friday. And then in nine weeks on that Friday, we'll test them again and see if it worked. And that was kind of the evolution of that one specific team. It's curious. Cause I mean, I think, with your population, there's probably a little bit more of a connection to fitness, but I know something Alex and I talk about is like, how do you, 
how do you turn over the goal setting of an organization as small as it might be company platoon, whatever, to somebody who maybe really has no clue about fitness and like, what is it? Cause like you just said, the original goal was just be fit or train hard or so how does, yeah. I don't know if this is like a rhetorical question or a question or a conversation starter, but it's, it's curious how you have those conversations because the flip side I would think is that you do see some strength coaches in this space where they just assume that they know the answer and they don't even ask the question. And then you can kind of run the risk of, of, you know, maybe losing buy-in guys become aggravated because, you know, that's not, we don't want to train like linebackers. We want to train like X, Y, Z. So not really a question, more of a thought, but yeah. I mean, just to follow up on that, I think, you know, I was a hundred percent one of those guys back in the day. I'll admit that for sure. And coming out, you know, having played college football and being in the college football world for a while, you know, you come out like just super, super hot and uh, definitely not the best attitude to come out as. And we, we had some good learning experiences there early on, but, you know, I think like a, a few of those being humble enough to ask some of the guys and go from there, but yeah, it's uh it's super hard. And sometimes you just have to let stuff happen that you don't like just to kind of, let the process happen so you can kind of clean it up on the back end. And sometimes that's a really frustrating train of thought and a really leads to a really frustrating answer sometimes, but <laughs> sometimes that's just the easiest because, you know, like a guy's not going to make, you know, maybe he won't let you approach him. If like, I don't know you, mm -hmm. like, I, have, I have no clue who you are. You're If I don't know you, you're not going to tell me what to do. Like fair, like right on. And so sometimes you just got to let him get comfortable in the space before you, you know, you kind of start wedging in there a little bit, but I think, you know, everybody who's been in this space for a long time can read people and has been around people enough that I think that's that's the biggest asset that you can do is just get to know people and learn how to read people a little bit better and interact with people, whether it be you learn the hard way or not. And then just start just start slowly just you know, there's throwing in a couple little nuggets here and there. And it could be mm -hmm. super broad, like Hey, we're lifting shoes. Don't change anything else. Just we're lifting shoes or whatever. Like it doesn't matter what it is. Just throw something in there. Mm -hmm. And then hopefully that just keeps snowballing. I think a layer of this too that I think a lot about. So like you obviously work, you're working with special forces, you're working with ODAs and stuff like that. And if it's hard in that environment to set a clear goal and explain the relevance of human performance, imagine when you start getting into like organizations that are further and further removed from direct combat type of stuff and like fewer and fewer enforced physical standards and things like that. Cause I know the reality check for me, my first two assignments were in infantry brigades. And then I went to a trade assignment where I was touching on the whole army and we got tuba players and respiratory lab technicians and chemists and admin guys. And like, there's like all of them matter too. And as we start rolling out human performance to broader and broader swaths of the military, we have more and more people working with organizations like that where connecting the physical and even the broader human performance stuff to what they do day in and day out can get more and more challenging. And that makes it more and more challenging to work with leadership on what the goal is and what the whole point of this is. It's the MOS for a tuba player. That's a great question. I don't know it offhand. I'll have to Google it. Shout out to all the tuba players, I guess. <laughs> Those things aren't light though, man. I mean, I'll be honest. I, some of my best master fitness trainers were musicians. I mean, we flirted with the idea and we'll do it eventually an episode about like the hardest PT tests. But I remember seeing a video of the guys that carry the caskets. Maybe this was Marine Corps guys, but their PT tests, I mean, you would, you know, Paul bears, it's pretty heinous stuff. Oh, the, the Marine Corps body bear PT test is ridiculous. Yeah. So there you go. Teasing a future conversation. Also, right. to, to circle back on the question though, I think all, and uh, people can slide into the DMs and correct me if I'm wrong on this one. I think all musicians are 42 Romeo, and then your instrument is an ASI. Interesting. I think. There you go. We learned something new. Yeah. All right, we're circling around our little game that we're going to play here. So I guess by now people might have seen the title of this episode or read the description, but we've we've come to the table each with, unless your name's Alex, you have five things. The, the rule was three. Uh, John, I don't know how many you have, but Three things we've changed. Three. You have three. I have three. Yeah, see, I so have I have three, and then two bonus ones if we have time. That's classic. All. So three <laughs> each. 
my thought was we would just kind of round robin, maybe start at three or five and, and work down to one. I don't know if anyone is opposed, but each individual will state their thing, perhaps a little uh, a riff on it and see if it opens up any discussion. We may not even get through all nine of these, but you know, who's to say? Alex, I'll turn it over to you to go first. You've been in the the field the shortest amount of time. You want me to go first? Okay. Sure. What's your well, number? This is what's number three for you. There's there's an important disclaimer up front on this, and that is that, like you said, I've been in this field less than either Drew or John, and it's even a stretch to say I'm in the field if we assume the field is strength and you're, conditioning. You're field adjacent. Yeah, I'm field adjacent. I have like a CSCS, but that doesn't make you a strength coach. That's just a certification, and I work primarily. In terms of like both mobs and most and day-to-day stuff, it's more about like organizational, bureaucratic, whatever. That's why I know all these regs and Drew doesn't care about that stuff because he cares about strength conditioning. And apples. So mine are going to probably not be as specific as theirs to like stuff that happens in the gym necessarily. Um, but I think they still apply. So whatever. Are you going to have that? Is that disclaimer going to come before all three of yours? No, it's a disclaimer for all. Okay. <laughs> Uh, but the the first one, and this relates to like the difference between being certified and being like experienced and stuff, um, is I've changed my mind on how you define expert, and and where I started on that, and you guys will both probably laugh at this, but when you're in the army, there's like a perception of what expertise is in any given domain, and in fitness, if you're like I'm, if you're like score high in your PT test, or you have master fitness trainer, you're like a little bit more expert than other people, but nothing crazy. And then if you get a TSAC, you're like kind of a big deal. You like know some stuff. You have a real certification now. And then if you get a CSCS, you are like an untouchable expert. As soon as you achieve that status, like no one can question your guidance on fitness because you're the smartest person there. And both of you guys being strength and conditioning coaches know that the CSCS is an entry level certification for actual professionals in the field. That's kind of the beginning of the journey, not the end when you've achieved expertise. So it's kind of a Dunning Kruger scenario where like getting the certification is the peak of Mount Stupid. And then you realize how little you actually know. And you start over on the journey of gradually figuring out how things actually work. Um, and then to go with that too, I've also worked with plenty of people who don't have a certification some like for a variety of reasons, maybe it's because they're focused on a specific sport and they're not worried about going broader to strength and conditioning. Maybe it's because they don't have a college degree, but there are plenty of people who are personal trainers that I would describe as experts because they have a ton of actual experience working with people and learning how to motivate them and learning how to engage them, all that kind of stuff. So I don't think like any specific set of letters after a person's name makes them an expert. I think, I mean, John mentioned earlier, like being able to read people potentially being more important than the stuff you learn in a textbook in this field. And I would agree with that. And also particularly in the tactical space, learning to navigate the culture and the bureaucracy being just as important to expertise as like the science component of it. The thing that comes to my mind with that is social media. Honestly, for, for better than for worse, I think, because, and this is something that John and I have kind of texted about over the years, but like I would, I would argue that at least in the tactical space, the hybrid kind of training approach that we've talked about is is arguably the the more appropriate. And if you if you come at that only relying on these sort of quote unquote experts, you know, traditionally people that have published research or have books or hold clinics, you end up in in my experience, you end up with kind of a piecemeal set up where you're like, okay, well, this guy is a, a quote unquote expert in endurance. And this guy is kind of a quote unquote expert in powerlifting. So let's combine those things. And here I have these two expert opinions and I've put them together into this expert plan. And I noticed myself starting to take more guidance and and finding more information from folks that might not be considered an expert for a lot of the reasons you just said, they might not have the CSCS or the degree or whatever, but they can deadlift 500 pounds and run a mile in under five minutes. And like, if somebody can do that, I, I'm probably more interested in what they have to say versus somebody that's published a book about why you should only do split squats instead of back squats. I won't name names there, but uh, that's what comes to mind for me when it comes to <laughs> defining experts. Yeah, I think, yeah, I mean, it's kind of hard to go last on that because I think you guys have covered a lot, but. <laughs> we don't have to have commentary on every point. Yes, we do. Okay, go for 
<laughs> no, I mean, I would just add a little bit. Like, I think the biggest thing is just being able to realize people's skill sets and like looking at just the broader range of MOSs that you might encounter in any given day. And sometimes like going back to my point of you just have to let some people do what they do and just watch them and figure it out and see where you can interject. But that's hundred percent a two way street. And it's really some of the best conversations have always been, you know, you see somebody do something, whatever it is, or like a sequence of movements or a pairing of movements, or, you know, you see him come in and do this on Monday and you see him come back and do this on Tuesday and you start linking things together in your mind from kind of your perspective using, you know, whatever experience you have, they're clearly doing the same. And um, I mean, there's definitely a way that's a perfect way. Uh, so some of the best conversations and learning experiences, especially in the tactical world, uh, that totally 100% threw all my CSCS stuff upside down <laughs> uh, was kind of was kind of nice just to get those conversations and, you know, just kind of challenge your thought. Be a, you know, it might just be help you to defend and strengthen why you believe what you believe in, or it really made you question what you were doing. Mm -hmm. uh, but either way, like just in just in the people you encounter in a daily interaction, I think there's there's so much knowledge and so much uh, just kind of like that bro science mentality that can really, really come to fruition at the end of the day, if you allow it. For sure. All right, John, you go next. What's your, what's your third one? My third one uh, uh, is basically just talking about how much outside activities matter. And I think the first, so going back I'm a very disciplined training person. So if it's written down for me, I'm going to do it. Anybody who, when I first, especially when I first started, anybody who kind of expanded beyond that for me was really hard for me to wrap my head around. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's not on paper. So why, why are you doing that? I don't get it. And then, you know, getting into the tactical space, you realize that you have to be a lot more flexible and fluid in terms of how you carry things out on a daily, weekly, monthly basis, whatever it is. And then that kept expanding to then I had kids and that caused me to not care about training as much or have to figure out ways to make up training, which was a huge hurdle for me. Uh, and you see like this just kept this expanding of man, like, you know, if I can't stay to this dedicated training plan, maybe I need to find other activities that will allow me to accomplish a similar goal. And I think like really in the tactical space, you run into that a lot because you're dealing with people that are going through the exact same thing or have gone through it or will go through it. And so I think you can really kind of speak to that um, in, in terms of really being flexible and allowing to find what a guy likes to do and making sure that it, that's always kind of a present component in the program. And so that allows a little bit of give and take on, on both of your ends. What yeah, what comes to mind when you say that for me is um is uh and we've I mean we've had John Kylie on here before, but his paper on stress and then sort of the conversations we've had about stress in general over a number of episodes and this idea that I mean, because to your point, I don't I don't remember ever in graduate school being taught to consider like the mood state of my athlete or the fact that maybe they just have an and I'll bring this up in kind of my Point here next but they might have an aversion to a deadlift versus an rdl or they might just be super tired because you know from a tactical standpoint they had uh, a mission simulation the night before and so you're not always getting well actually you're never getting a fresh one you know 100 ready to go athlete every morning and rinse and repeat over and over again why aren't you sticking to the program you do have to account for all of that stuff and i think for me from a strength and conditioning standpoint, realizing that stress includes all of those things was, was huge. I mean, Drew made fun of me for having five things, but if we, if we get into my bonus things, one of them is, is closely related to this and it's kind of a, a shift from worrying about, I mean, it's, it's a shift of what your priorities are. And I think coming into this from a physical fitness background it's easy to get really focused initially on like the x's and o's of the program and even fitness itself as being the top priority and i think i adjusted my perspective a little bit realizing that fitness 
is probably the like superficial layer of this whole thing. It's where you can quantify things the most easily. It's where you can notice things. It's easy to connect with people on. It's easy to design all that kind of stuff. But most of, I don't know about most of, but a lot of what happens in terms of people's physical fitness and even people's physical health probably is the result of things that are happening deeper in that human system, whatever you want to call it, outside stressors, life stuff, family stuff, whatever else it is. So we we end up talking about physical fitness a lot. I know people are going to wonder why like 90% of the episodes of this podcast are physical fitness if I'm saying this, but I think physical fitness is the most accessible part of the whole thing, but not necessarily the most important part of the whole thing. I agree with that. Yeah. My turn. Okay. So the third one that I have on here was exercises versus movement patterns. And I don't necessarily mean to go down a, like a rabbit hole of what, you know, what are the four or seven like functional movement, whatever. But I think kind of similar, John, to your point, when I, first started, I was coming into this tactical space from a sports background and in the sporting arena, you kind of have a little bit more control over things like GPS metrics and and movement patterns. And you can, I mean, for me, it was overseas doing stuff with rugby, but even like here with football, you have an idea of what a wide receiver needs to do or a center or, you know, whatever. And I think I took that into a tactical realm thinking okay well we should we should always back squat bench press deadlift because those are the big ones and then you realize that maybe it's maybe this guy just prefers front squatting over back squatting so how do i fit that in maybe like i was mentioning they have an aversion to a deadlift because they hurt their back previously doing something and we have to find how to work around or find a way to work around that and i realized over time that sure, there are movements that you could get more bang for your buck out of. Like inevitably you can load a back squat more than a front squat. Cool. But kind of alongside this thought process of like, maybe we don't need to put as much weight, no pun intended on like a one rep max. We do have a lot more freedom to choose different movement patterns as opposed to just thinking that we always need to do certain exercises because at the end of the day, combat is not as quantifiable as a, a game with, you know, much more control over the metrics. And so who's to say that having a double body weight deadlift makes you more lethal? It it might, it also might not. So where can we diversify that training time? So I think that was for me kind of early on, one of the big things that I, I changed my mind on. I think there's a, there's a slide I think I've shouted out Champ on this podcast before, Consortium for Health and Military Performance, and they have a slide that they use in some of the briefings where it like starts with a single athlete and then it goes to like a crew team. And I could ask how complicated this is when you look at a crew team. And as far as like team physical stuff goes, a crew team is relatively simple. It's like essentially one movement repeated over and over and over again. You can Those guys are freaks race though, distance man. and stuff. Yeah, but there's a lot going on and there's a lot to think about and all that stuff. And so if you start digging into the complexity of something like that, and then the next slide you're talking about field sports. So it just got a ton more complicated because you have different positions doing different things and a lot of stuff going on and reacting to other people. And then you go from there to like, I think they use a slide that has a picture of an ODA, like a, a bunch of military guys walking in the woods, rucks, weapons, performing whatever the mission is. And like, obviously it gets more and more complex as you go from one to the next. And I think, it's easy to find books and articles and videos and stuff. They'll tell you like exactly what tactical professionals or operators need when it comes to fitness. And every single one of those is dramatically oversimplifying it because there's too many different jobs and too many different missions. And I mean, to be fair, it kind of comes back to GPP. Um, I think it's fun to like talk about sexy, really specific stuff, but a lot of what we're doing in this space is, is that general physical preparedness. Also, feel free to disagree with anything anyone says. I think we didn't lay that groundwork out at the beginning. <laughs> I think that was actually like leads into my number two point a little bit, just looking at. Perfect. You're up next. <laughs> oh, perfect timing. So I think it honestly builds onto the like my number two, and we can kind of skip over this one if you want, but really talking about just no perfect exercises or progression. Mm-hmm. And really my my big thing to carry on to to use i think the biggest thing i was listening to a a podcast is actually a few years ago 
uh, with Derek Witzke when he's talking about his vertical integration, how he applies that to weightlifting. And just the whole thing of how you have to find the thing that is the basically pick the easiest thing that has the biggest neurological impact for that person. Mm -hmm. And that kind of, that quickly reframed a lot for me. Cause I was a big, like, you know, Oh, we're going to progress from this lift to this, lift to from this one to this one. And then basically it's like, well, I mean, if we can hit some kind of squat pattern today, cool. Uh, and then let's just kind of see what this person is capable of. And we'll just find the best one that suits that for them and then keep going from there. And, and really like let's mess with it for a few days and get through a week and then maybe let's advance that the following week. And that might look different for every single person. And that's where it gets a little bit complicated trying to string those things together. But that's also part of the fun. Yeah. Do you, this is a rhetorical, well, maybe it is a direct question, but do you find, would you rather put an athlete on or, or maybe force an athlete onto some sort of like call it eight week progression on a back squat knowing that they they're kind of half into it because they don't really love squatting all that much maybe they have like an endurance background and they're kind of averse to lifting weights would you rather force them down that for eight weeks or spend three of those eight weeks playing around with different movements that you think they might like and then the remaining five kind of pushing them you know through that if that if that question makes sense more towards the latter for sure um i think Anytime you can find something that's going to pull them into the weight room, you know, especially per your example, like if you have a runner that maybe they're a little averse to the weight room or to flip that one around and you have a lifter that's a little averse to running because you, we can talk about the prescriptions being pretty similar. I think the biggest thing is you have to find something that they like to do. You know, do you really like the rower? Fine. Or do you really like deadlifting over squatting? Like at this point, I'm probably, Really not going to argue too much with that mm. and then i'm going to spend the rest of that time trying to find some really like fun and progressive and maybe slightly over complicated uh you know some set rep schemes and then we'll just really play with those because if you can get somebody good with a movement they'll probably start being they'll be more willing to mess around with other things but if you just throw movements that they hate i think they're just going to shut down mm -hmm. yeah for sure that ties to one of my classic rants, not rants, sidebars, commentaries, whatever you want to call it, but uh, Bloom's Taxonomy of Learning. I've done a post on the Instagram page before. I'll probably do it again. It's probably about time. But you got three domains. Cognitive is the kind of stuff you learn in the classroom, facts, patterns, memorizations, how to apply that kind of stuff. Psychomotor is the kind of stuff you learn in the gym, how to move, all that kind of stuff. And then affective is learning to make something part of your identity internalizing things, starting to care about them, all that kind of stuff. And not to like lessen the importance of learning stuff in the classroom or learning stuff in the gym, but I don't, I don't care about those if I can't get somebody to care in general. Right. So I am always going to prioritize how can I, you guys use the word fun. Both of you use the word fun a bunch of times in there. We're fun people. And, That's why. I, right. I don't think I don't know if the word fun appears in the CSCS textbook, right? I don't know if it's like a priority that's given to any of this stuff. CACSMs. Actually, I think yeah. CrossFit level one has fun somewhere in there. Probably. And mm -hmm. and that's there's a it's whole a, conversation there about like it's a hero wad. If if a program is like slightly less scientifically optimal, but much more fun, I think you're gonna see dramatically better adherence, more like, engagement. They're gonna want to learn more about why it is the way it is. They're gonna start like seeking that stuff out. But like, again, what is an optimal? More important. This is a tangent, but like, what is an optimal program? Nobody knows. It's okay. Right? I mean, we've had discussions on here before. We have another one tomorrow. Like, okay, optimal based on this research paper, but like, who, who were the subjects in that paper, and what you know? So I don't know. I I. I think that's an important point. And I don't know if it's on any of you guys' lists. It's not necessarily on mine, but I think fun and compliance and things like that are are very valuable commodities versus everything on this. Because I've, I've sat in real, like in, in grad school, I remember taking a class where you had to create a program and pitch it to the director of sport for one of the professional soccer leagues in, in Scotland. And it, every movement you put in there had to be linked back to a paper. I was like, what the... <laughs> Cool. I'm prepared for nothing in real life. Anyway, sorry, a rant, but yeah, I'm, I'm with you. I think something that is fun and enjoyable and creates compliance is, is far more important to me. Yeah, I think 
if I was going to look at what is an optimal program, if I can get them to show up more days than not hmm. and three things, we'll stick with the rules of three here. So we got, if that drives them to be uh, more consistent than not, if it drives them to uh, be more willing to utilize other facets of the program, be it maybe they have a small side talk with an ATC about some prehab specific stuff that's not my opinion. Perfect. Utilize the program to your full capability. And three, uh, keep them out of the PT or the medical side as much as you can. Mm -hmm. I dig it. And I think if you're doing things, then it's probably optimal for the person. Um, yeah, what you just said ties into my number two really well. It's almost like we planned it, not at all. I think when I when I entered this space, which was not as long ago as it was for either of you guys, but I think it's easy to assume that like somewhere there must be people who have this all figured out. Like somewhere there's like an elite soft organization that has human performance on lockdown. It's called Tenth Group like, out in Germany we, with John. And we all just yeah, exactly. And we all just need to learn from them. And and the more I've spent, and this this applies in strength and conditioning, it applies in human performance, but it also applies like to everything I've ever been exposed to, every profession, every area of expertise. The more curtains that get pulled back and the more I get to see the way progressively more quote unquote elite organizations do this stuff, it's the same stuff. Everybody's trying to figure out the same problems. They haven't solved all of them. They they probably have people who like might have a couple extra credentials or they might have a people who care a little extra more, whatever it is. They might have well, more money. I was going to say the most consistent have, thing. They have more money. Yeah, usually it's more it's money. Fun. But I, I've just kind of come to the realization that like nobody has the whole puzzle solved, and there's not like a secret place you're trying to get to where everything's amazing. Everybody's kind of reckoning with the same problems. And yes, you can you can cover up some of those problems with money, right? And sometimes programs are received a lot better when they have all the amazing equipment that money can buy. But I think one of the big ones is, and this is like specific to military human performance, as you get into like more and more elite organizations, it's easy to assume that like everybody loves the human performance program and utilization is 100% and things are great. And I think if people knew the actual utilization numbers for some of these programs, they would be shocked. And so just like that, that opening of my aperture to everybody's got problems they're trying to deal with, regardless of the echelon they're at. And money solves some of them, but it does not solve all of them. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'll do it. Okay. I'll go on a rant. Like, I think that that's an issue with tactical strength and conditioning as an industry, because, you know, every year we have a handful of conferences and they all say the same thing. And this is no, because like, I, you know, we all know a lot of the people that give these presentations and they're great. They're well thought out. It's awesome. But no one is actually having conversations with or around the athletes it's they're usually not there it's usually just a bunch of coaches which in fairness is the nature of some of these these conferences and these conversations but i don't think that the industry as a whole has really sat down and and kind of interrogated itself to say okay like what what is an agreed upon definition of a tactical athlete like what are the demands of this athlete we there are some of it on the fringes i think that happened but a lot of it is through the lens of as compared to a football player or as compared to a track athlete, like let's take some things from those industries and just map them onto this. And it goes back to what we say all the time about a lot of folks approach a tactical athlete as a football player in camouflage. And it's, it's just a totally unique and different, I almost said the word species. I'm going to stick with specimen. Um, and, and I think that we would do well to have a lot more transparency because you're right. I think a lot of, a lot of people will kind of hide behind the fact that their organization might be a little bit more secretive than yours. And that's great, but that doesn't necessarily mean we can't have an honest conversation around compliance. And, and maybe we just make it a rule that on the first slide of your presentation, you have to put your compliance percentage. Like, Hey, I'm here to talk to you guys today about agility for tactical athletes. And Oh, by the way, of the 500 uh, soldiers I work with, 12 of them use my program. You know, I, th I say that jokingly, although it would be kind of interesting um, and, and that's not to knock anybody either, because we're all, like you said, dealing with a lot of the same struggles. Like it is a new space. It's only been around for a couple of years, even, you know, Thor three where, where John's at and even further back, I mean, maybe 10, 15 years at most, have we had folks embedded into tactical training spaces? But I think that we, a lot of us walk around just assuming that everyone else has it figured out. And like you said, the more you pull back the curtain, you realize very few people actually do, and we would probably do well to like get together as a as a organization, as an industry, 
and have some conversations that aren't just here's how to set up some cones and foam roll if you're in the military. Cause I'm so tired of seeing those presentations every year. Sorry. Okay. And I'll step off my soapbox. You're, I won't go off too long on this one because I'm working on a blog post on like related to that topic. And I think part of it is foam rolling. No, definitely not on foam rolling. Oh, part of it is the idea that tactical strength and conditioning is the same as athletic strength and conditioning, just with a different sport. And, and I, I do not think that is the case fundamentally. I think, hmm. and a lot of coaches, especially as like H2F, radically expands the scale of tactical strength and conditioning, military strength and conditioning. I think there are a lot of coaches who came in expecting to walk into a facility full of squat racks and be handed a whistle and a clipboard and just have to change the X's and O's of their program to match the demands of the quote unquote sport and then just lead service members through workouts. And a lot of them are finding out some pleasantly, some painfully that that's not what the job is. And like a huge portion of the job becomes, especially if you like deal with higher coach to athlete ratio kind of stuff, becomes education and becomes working with leadership and becomes a lot of things that might not be as inherent in athletic context. Yeah, it changes a lot. I think like, I just keep going back to thinking about when I first started, when, when POTA first started. Uh, and I got hired on in 2013 and, you know, you, you come straight out of that collegiate environment and you think you can, it, it is like an easy segue. Like you said, like, you know, it, it's because that's the way it's kind of sold to you. And so you get in and you're like, wow. And I will say, like, I think the people that didn't figure that out, I mean, there's a reason they're not here anymore, mm -hmm. unfortunately, you know, so I think. For some of them, they they learn the hard way for sure. But I think like going back to Drew's point as well, I think like trying to tie all the, the conference stuff and all this stuff in, like I think like it really comes down to just getting the right person. You know, I do agree that at conferences, uh, you know, we need to kind of expand that and include other people other than just other coaches. I think it'd be great to you know, include a couple of the guys from your unit. Like, I just want you to, to show up and just tell me what you think. What's your perspective? Like, what's BS and what's great? But also, too, and, you know, you always look at other people like, man, they haven't figured out. They they have, like, you know, I follow them on Instagram or whatever, and they haven't figured out for sure. But I think on the flip side is, like, some people think they haven't figured out. And, like, that's a problem. Mm -hmm. And I think, like, you know, being out here for sure has taught me a lot of, you know, you already, you're already going from an island of being in a group and then you go overseas and you just shrink that island. And so it's almost like I've, I think I've reached out to more people in the last four years than I have the previous years before that, because being the only strength coach, it makes me really uncomfortable uh, just because I want to make sure that I'm always doing the right thing. And whenever I feel really comfortable and, and I start handing out things and it's easy for me that's an instant red flag for me of like i did like it's it's not as good as it can be mm -hmm. you know so i think like that's driven me to talk to a bunch of people and i think that dialogue just has to expand like i, I don't have a really good answer for that but that dialogue has to expand mm -hmm. are we on me for my second one we are you're up okay um this should come as a surprise to no one that this is on my list it was actually I had it as number one and then I, I moved some things around, but um, changing my mind on periodization versus planning. And specifically, I've said this before many, many times, but reading some of John Kiley's critiques on periodization, that was the first instance of me starting to actually question it. One, because the, the writing is very well thought out, but two, because again, coming out of a, a very formal strength and conditioning education, you're not even really taught that there's an alternative to this, you know, menu of, of Soviet, Russian, occasionally Chinese, like training options. Like the, the fact that you would not do block or linear or conjugate or whatever, like the fact that you wouldn't do that would like, that would be sacrilegious. So stepping into, into the tactical space with some of this idea that, okay, I need to have a very well thought out 12 week, one year, 
two year macro cycle, whatever you want to call it, breaking it down into all these phases and predicting everything. And then I hand the athlete this beautiful spreadsheet that has all these percentages and projections. And here's where we're going to be in 12 weeks. And then realizing very quickly that, oh man, he missed all of that week or wow, we were supposed to do the thing on Tuesday and he wasn't there because the night before they were jumping out of helicopters. So it kind of organically fell apart for me. And I started to then look around and figure out, well, one, why is that happening? And then two, what do I do about it? And that's when I stumbled on some of John's work. But I think an important point there, which we've talked about a number of times and we still get blasted for, is that a lack of periodization does not mean you're not planning your training. It's not random. It's not chaos. So for me, it was taking a step back from this long range model and instead focusing on, okay, what can I control? For me, that looks like next week. I can put some constraints around what next week looks like. And then given things that we know are coming up on the calendar, missions, deployments, whatever, we can kind of navigate towards where we need to go, taking into consideration all the things that we've kind of already talked about here athletes, mood state, things they like, things they don't like, compliance, stress, blah, 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 blah. To me, that all fed into this idea of planning versus this more traditional concept of periodization where I have to give you a block thing or a linear thing or a conjugate thing. So I, I know we could riff about that for a really long time, so I'll stop there. But for me, that was number two, just changing my mind about periodization and coming at it more from a planning perspective. Over. There's a there's an Eisenhower quote that I think about a lot. I know it's surprising to have an Eisenhower quote relevant to periodization. Good big strength um, coach, Eisenhower, big lifter. Right. But mm -hmm. the quote is in preparing for battle, I've always found that plans are useless, but planning is indispensable. See? And the, exactly. the idea there is that like everybody's heard, like no plan survives first contact with the enemy, all that kind of stuff. And the idea is that the actual plan you have built is never going to get executed. It's not going to happen. But going through the process of planning and creating it should help you better understand the problem you're working with, the resources you have available, all these various considerations. And I think you got to make sure that whatever planning you're doing, whether it's periodized or otherwise, you got to make sure that that process you're going through is actually helping you better understand the problem you're dealing with rather than like trying to better understand a theory that doesn't have a lot to do with what you're actually dealing with. And that's, again, Drew already said it, we could go down a giant rabbit hole on this one if we wanted to, and we have on other episodes, but I'll kind of leave it there. Yeah. I think when you just look at even like the, the first example we started off with of that team sort of like, Hey, we have nine weeks to figure this out, which is super rare, mm -hmm. but let, let's just take like that time frame of like, okay, well, these people need to be able to ruck better at the end of the year. And like really between here and there, it doesn't really matter what it looks like as long as at the end of the year, they can still ruck better. So I think, you know, you have to accept a bunch of peaks and valleys within that. And, you know, they're not going to be here this week or they're going to be gone this month or whatever. And for that reason, you always have to have a backup plan. So mm -hmm. what, what will always make sure that they are as consistent as they can be in the environment, in the environment that they are in. And like, is it ideal to have, uh, you know, is it really super sexy to have like a really high like neural overload day in the weight room and like, like throw in some like all the Olympic lifts and all the everything? Yeah, for sure. But like, you know, can we get like a, a, a pretty good uh, neural shot with just some sprinting and some jumps? Yeah. And like, will that kind of continue to push the needle to get you to where you need to go in five, six, seven months? Yeah. So I think you know, just kind of just keeping your mind on the long-term goal and not kind of getting distracted with all this stuff in the middle. And then you always have to have that backup plan of what can we continue to do so we can, you know, we might have to kind of slow down from a run and start walking a little bit, but as long as we don't sit down, we're fine. Mm -hmm. I dig it. It makes me think my like very first job in the army, one of the things my office was responsible for is we had the plotter, the printer that can print out giant stuff. And like the S3 shop used to love having us print out the training calendar, giant wall sized. <laughs> and it was frustrating every time I did it. Cause you know, like the moment you hit print on the calendar, it's going to change. Something has already changed. And it's probably only a couple weeks out that the change is going to start messing everything up and it's going to have a waterfall effect of like, none of that plan works anymore. And I think 
I have a feeling that most people who worked around the military have had that experience or some version of it before where you like make a beautiful plan for everything and then it all gets thrown out of the window within a couple of days. Well, and I'm, I'm going to break sure. the rules because I'm going to come back and add another opinion to this. And I think <laughs> had I rephrased, because I know capital P periodization like triggers people, um, had I rephrased this, it might be a conversation about just like as a strength coach, you can't predict the future. Um, but you're not taught that you're taught that you can. And it's, it's funny because for me personally, like, so my undergraduate degree is in, is in business with a healthy dose of economics and in economics, you're taught all these models about how the economy works, but the whole time you're taught those models, you're also told like, Hey, look, these fall apart in reality. So how do you navigate around? Like, sure. Supply and demand looks like this in a vacuum, but realistically, that's not how it actually breaks down. So how do you navigate around that? And I compare that to the way that I was taught strength and conditioning, which is here's how the human body works in a vacuum. It's also how the human body works in real life. And if it breaks down, like there's something wrong with your plan, you got to fix it. The athletes, you know, blah, blah, blah. Nobody's really equipped to handle the fact that you can't actually predict outcomes. You need to be a little bit more responsive as a coach. And I don't know. I mean, we talked to Keichi about this. I don't know if that's a knock on sort of the academic space or just maybe it's hard to teach those skills in a classroom, but yeah, again, I know I'm breaking the rules by circling back around and having a second opinion, but changing your mind about the fact that you cannot predict stuff as pretty as it might look on a spreadsheet or like you were saying, a plotter. But anyway, back, back to the game. Who's up next? I think it's you, John, with your number one. Is that right? Yeah, sure. So number one is uh, pretty easy, and I think it just keeps expanding on some of this other stuff. But this is always a fun topic if you go to TSAC and start throw this bomb out there is that in the tactical space, Olympic lifting uh, is really bad. Oh, hot take. Expand. Okay, so, you know, I think the easiest answer is just looking at Olympic lifting as a sport in and of itself. And it, these guys have a lot of stuff wrong with them that we need to correct first. And none of which remotely revolves around Olympic lifting. And if I have a guy that like, you know, it, like take some concerted effort to put on shoes in the morning and things like that. Like why are, why are we even having this conversation about push jerks and snatches? But, you know, I think some people are so uh, caught on just the overall, like, I think it honestly goes back to the athletic model of, you know, if you're, if you're in athletics, you do Olympic lift and you do lift this and you do lift that. And there's certain movements that are just non-negotiables. And the longer I've been in the space, don't get me wrong. There are some guys that, can crush some Olympic lift in the space, but they are very few and far between. And that's not to knock anybody else. And if you want to spend your own time kind of learning that skill, that's fine. Uh, but my take on it is when you come in to me, I consider that when you come in, by, when, by the time you come in and by the time you leave, I need to make sure that you left better than you came in. And if you start throwing Olympic lifting into the equation, I can't guarantee that. And that's why we don't do that. That's hot. That's a hot take. Cause I mean, you, you yourself, I think, I feel like last time I saw you, you were doing snatches with some 2008 Addy stars, which is like the OG weightlifting show. I still have those. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah, I hundred percent still have those. And yeah, I competed in Olympic lifting for a while. And so I can obviously say that because I'm pretty good at Olympic lifting. <laughs> so, um, but I do think like my first dose reality came in when I just, I just started getting older mm -hmm. and I was just like, dude, like I just can't handle this like I used to, or I just had to be a little bit more efficient in training. So you have to start, you know, trimming the fat on terms of like, if I have 45 minutes, what do I need to do to make sure that I have a really effective training session today? Personally, that was, that was, you know, a pretty bumpy ride for me in just terms of being stubborn and just kind of keep coming back to it. But you know, that helped me kind of go through that personal journey and learn so I could kind of speak from that, like to other people. And again, if guys come in and they're crushing it and they just need a little bit of correction, I'm not going to stop them. But if you come in and you're like, I just really want to snatch, but okay, cool. Have you ever snatched before? No, then you're not doing it. And so like on our workout uh, sheets, you know, when we get kind of team and individual specific, even now, like I'll have Olympic and non Olympic, non Olympic variations of almost the same lift as we go through that way. If you're one of those guys that can do it, this is what you, you don't. 
Well, that's now the second coach we've had on the podcast who's taken a strong stance against Olympic lifting and tactical. We might have to like represent the other side and bring somebody on who wants to advocate for it. <laughs> I think um, I, I agree with you. I, I think, uh, like you said, I mean, I've, I've had guys and girls that are are good at it and competent, and they come to you and they want to just sort of progress and build on that. And I think that that can be appropriate. But I, I mean, to just add maybe a hot take to your hot take, I, I blame a little bit. I blame CrossFit for that, the sense that Olympic lifting, and, and when I say Olympic lifting, I mean full full depth snatches, full cleans, full jer- like the, those two big tested movements. I think that CrossFit sort of sold this idea that those are a lot more accessible than maybe they actually are because you can rattle off a bunch of them in a minute at 75 pounds or whatever. And I think that the fact that it is its own sport and it is very skill dependent, it, it caters to the mindset that a lot of these tactical athletes have, which is mastery. I can master this thing, but they're not necessarily appreciating the training time that goes into that, the sacrifices that you have to make in terms of, like you said, having 45 minutes, well, where do I, how do I dose that out so that I can get the most bang for my buck? Not to mention I mean, you can argue all day long that it's a relatively safe sport and and sure it is, but if you've never thrown weight over your head in a full depth squat, even in a, a power variation, like there is a risk there that you might do something to your shoulder, to your knee, to your back, especially when I take into account the fact that I can simulate quote unquote, a lot of that same triple extension power off the floor force production. I can simulate a lot of that with some far safer movements that technically don't take as long to learn. So kind of a nerdy assessment maybe on my part, but I'm, I'm with you. I think that there's a time and a place and and the time is much shorter than people realize. And the place is, is probably far, far less frequent than people want it to be. I'll put a layer on this one. That's a little bit different and it, it comes back to the conversation about periodization. It comes back to the conversation about what gets talked about at conferences and seminars and stuff like that. I think, and I'll apply this to both periodization and Olympic lifting. They both create awesome scenarios where coaches get to look super smart and do cool things and like put things on PowerPoint slides and whatever it is. Like they, they create scenarios that are good for the coach they get to look smart. They get to look cool. They get to look proficient. They get to like dial in a specific cue and all these kinds of things. And that's great. And that's cool. But I don't think it properly accounts for how it actually affects the athlete and how much utility it actually has and what could be done with that time that might not be as sexy for the coach, but might be more practical and accessible and things like that. Uh, Again, that's a giant rabbit hole we could go down, but that's a layer I'll put on that. I was going to throw running mechanics coaching into there too, just to yeah, piss, probably. piss some more people off, but we'll, we'll skirt that. All right. Are we, Alex, you, you go with your number one and then I'll close this out. Yeah. So this one is, and we've actually talked about this on the podcast plenty before. It's kind of the whole reason we've had Newton on a couple of times and things like that, but it's, it's the, where should we be learning from? Like, where should we be taking our cues from as military human performance? And I think, since military human performance started in special operations, I, I think it's very logical and appropriate for special operations to take a lot of cues from collegiate and pro sport. I think that makes sense. I think the populations parallel each other a little bit better, things like that. I think as human performance spreads into more conventional spaces, less combat MOSs, all these kinds of things, I think those parallels break down pretty quickly. And this, I know I've triggered people before on this one, but the conversation of like, is this a high performance program or is this a health and wellness program? And I think that's a a false dichotomy. I think you cannot separate those two things. I don't think one is entirely separate from the other. You have to deal with both all the time, but I think we should be learning just as much on the health and wellness front as we are on the high performance front. And that means engaging with things like public health and things like corporate wellness and things like just just everywhere else, education. I think all of those have just as much of a role to play in understanding the space we work in as collegiate and pro weight rooms do. John, I'll let you go. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. I think like, I think even coming from the special operations side, like I think 
people, I think people think too much of the high performance model. And I think that you need to be capable of high performance, but that is not necessarily illustrated through weight room performance. So if I can go and if I can go and ruck really well or shoot lights out any given day, then you're still considered a high performer. But I think that there's a really broad stroke of GPP that's overlooked. And I think in general, people in this population need more GPP, either from a developmental standpoint or just a longevity standpoint. And I think that's where we dip into more of the like non-high performance side when you talk about it, but it's it's a false dichotomy for sure. I'm going to um, take it a step further because I agree. I think, and this is a, this comes up a lot, I think. And, and John, maybe you've seen this too. And Alex, actually, you might as well. Like you'll get questions a lot from younger strength coaches or, or students asking like, you know, which books should I read and what people should I follow and that kind of thing. And I remember Evan Pycon actually saying something about this a long time ago. Like he doesn't read training books anymore. And at the time when I heard that, I was like, that's crazy. Like, that's all I read. I love reading about strength and conditioning and podcasts and whatever. And then you quickly realize that like it, once you have kind of that initial foundation in terms of understanding how to apply resistance training, understanding how to apply endurance training and a little bit of skill work, like once you have that, a lot of the soft skills are where you need to spend most of your time. And so like, for me, I, I, I say this all the time, like the most influential book I ever read for my, my call it a practice as a strength and conditioning coach was the structure of scientific Revol revolutions, which is a philosophy book by a philosopher that has nothing to do with strength and conditioning, but it talks about how paradigm shifts happen. And, and I've said this before, but like getting into tactical strength and conditioning to me, I, I recognize it as a little bit of a paradigm shift personally and professionally in the sense of like, I need to take what I thought I knew about strength and conditioning and apply some of these thought processes, thought processes around how people change their minds to arrive at what I think is a more appropriate model for how to train athletes. So I think it, it could probably go a couple of different ways, Alex, your point about where do we look for knowledge? I think there's, there's all kinds of stuff you could read out there on training. I mean, there's endless volumes of things you could read. And if you've decided that doing backflips while holding a barbell is the appropriate way to do it, there's some guru out there who's probably got a book that will support that. And you can go find that and use that to justify why you're putting that first on a Monday. Like you could do that all day long. It's endless. But like we've mentioned, I think on a couple of these points kind of woven in here throughout, there's a lot of skills that are much more important in the weight room than, than reps and sets and, and barbells and glute ham developers. So get that knowledge and, and always kind of check back in on that, I think is important, but man, if you could expand outside of strength and conditioning, even outside of like public health, like you mentioned, and into some adjacent fields, psychology, philosophy, that sort of thing, I think that you'll be, you'll become a better practitioner at the end of it. That's my rant. I think that leaves you to close it out. Doesn't it? Oh yeah, I think so. I'm the last one. And this actually, so unintentional segue on my part, because I think this kind of builds off of what I was just saying. For me, like I said, originally I had the periodization thing as my number one and I changed it. My number one is that training is is far more athlete centric than I think I gave it credit for when I first started. And what I mean by that is that, again, I go back to kind of the formal strength and conditioning education. You're sort of taught that as a coach, you have all the answers and you have all the tools. The athlete comes to you, they say what they want. You take that into consideration. You analyze the sport, you disappear into your cave, you produce your magical plan. You come back out, you hand it to them. They go off and do it. They come back 12 weeks later, rinse and repeat, do that for four years. They go to the Olympics, they win a gold medal. That's kind of what I was taught. And then I realized through a lot of the things that I just ranted on there that compliance, athlete buy-in, the athlete's perspective on the training plan, um, the athlete's interests, those play a massive role in the success or failure of your training program. And when I realized that, I started asking questions like, hey, what do you want to do? Like, what do you think about the training plan? And occasionally you'll get an odd look because I think athletes are just sort of trained to think that like, oh, the coach has all the answers. But once I recognized that not only programming, but also coaching was much more of a collaborative experience and less of a, I have all the answers and I'm just going to give you the thing. 
um, it, it opened up a whole world of, of possibility in terms of, Hey, the, the target on the calendar is, is a year from now. We know what that target is, but how we get there is going to be very different for every single athlete. And it's going to fluctuate even for any particular athlete across that year. So for me, that, that kind of became my number one is that the athlete has, the athlete plays a much, much bigger role in the training process than I think I originally thought. I think that fits with the overall concept of like calling it human performance, right? I think when you, when you, I used the phrase open the aperture more and this, this ties to other stuff we've talked about in this episode, but there's a ton of other factors that go into human performance besides some theoretical prediction of how they're going to respond to a physical stress or stimulus. And nobody, and we sometimes pretend that you can predict the future in the strength space, but once you start factoring in all the other potential stressors and components of human performance, I don't think anybody would pretend you can predict all of that. I think that inevitably leads you towards a more athlete centric model. Yeah, I think, I don't know, this conversation just kind of reminds me too of like, you know, just going back to the original question of why are you even a coach? And I think that's really, is it, is it to be really good in Excel and, you know, does that help you? Sure. Uh, but, you know, I think like, as I've gotten older a little bit, that, that perspective has definitely changed. And like, I, I came about it a little bit different as well, because both my undergrad and graduate degrees are in psych and, you know, I think like, you know, sometimes like, you know, as a strength coach, some of the most important stuff you can do, not only for yourself, but for the guys is just be there as be there as a good human. And I think, you know, does a guy coming in just griping about all of his personal problems, does that accomplish the training goal for the day? hundred percent not, but can he leave the gym and then probably be a better dude at work and then go home and be a better dude at home than if that, if the answer is yes, then you've probably done your job in terms of overall performance. And I think, you know, the more I've kind of thought about that and interact with people, you know, if you, you can, it, it kind of goes back to the people for me. And if you can, if you can start to tie in all those things together and even being a good example yourself, like, Oh, you know, I, I see, I see coach eating vegetables. So I'm going to eat vegetables, like whatever, you know, as long as you can provide some good example and just making sure that you're just, you're just there for people. And sometimes that is all they want is squats. And that is awesome. But sometimes like they just need to kind of just need to kind of float around and do their own thing and just kind of gripe about stuff. And that's also fine. And as a coach, that can be super frustrating. But, you know, when you kind of boil it down to the basis of why are you a coach, then I still think sometimes like you just have to go, you just have to ask yourself that question. I can't think of a uh, more beautiful closer, Alex, unless you have anything. No, I think we got it. That was good stuff. Boom. All right, gentlemen, thank you for coming to today's game of three things you've changed your mind on. John, thanks for tuning in all the way from Germany. Yeah, thanks for having me, guys. Awesome. Hey, Alex, let's cover our ass real quick. Oh, great idea, Drew. All right, guys. The views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views or positions of any entities they represent. Thanks for tuning into this week's episode. Before you go, please rate and review the pod on the listening platform of your choice. You can also visit us on our website at www.mopsinmos.com. That's mops, the letter in mos.com. You can check out the library of podcast episodes our latest blog entries, any helpful resources, and also sign up for our newsletter. Drew nailed it. Just to underline a couple of things, the podcast entries have in-depth show notes on the website. So if you missed anything or you want to read any of the research we talk about, it is all there. You can, at the bottom of the website, sign up with your email and receive future updates from us. The blog posts go a little bit more in depth in kind of written form on a couple of topics we get questions about all the time. But most importantly, I just want to ask all you guys, our best way the word gets out is absolutely word of mouth. So tell your friends, tell the people you work with, anybody you think would find it useful. Thanks for spreading the word. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to shoot us an email at either Drew or Alex at mopsandmos.com. Or there's a contact form on the website. Thank you.